course, she was this wonderful Italian import. She was a big sex goddess, God. I mean, Bella, Sofia, mwah. I think she had the same thing that Cleopatra must have had. She had a commanding presence. Sophia Loren, aside from being extremely beautiful physically, is one of the most exciting, witty women on this planet. What she became, of course, is unique. Sophia is the only honest-to-God international movie star. For nearly half a century, she has dazzled audiences with her eternal beauty and earthy sensuality. But Sophia Loren's almost charmed life of international fame and domestic tranquility masks a childhood of abject poverty and years of hard work. Her rags to riches story outclasses any fairy tale. Nothing to lose. Leads you to where you are today. I believe in storytelling. It's gonna make you a star. I'm still trying to figure that out. Sofia Loren was born Sofia Chicolone on September 20th, 1934, in a hospital charity ward for unwed mothers in Rome, Italy. Her mother, Romilda Villani, was a stunning 20-year-old who dreamed of becoming a movie star. Her father, Ricardo Chicolone, was a handsome young engineer who had told Romilda he was a film producer. It was not the first lie Ricardo would tell or that Romilda would believe. When Romilda announced she was pregnant, Ricardo refused to marry her. And so, after Sofia's birth, the single mother returned to her family in Pozzuoli, a poor village near Naples. Well, it was just grazio, I mean, that this woman conceived this child out of wedlock. But nevertheless, the grandmother again, who apparently was a woman of some moxie, I guess, she really stood up for these things. She took them in. Little Sophia was a sickly infant and a scrawny child. Neighborhood children taunted her, not only for her illegitimacy, but also for her thin, malnourished figure. They nicknamed her Stuzzicarenti, or Toothpick. To complicate matters, Sophia's mother had continued her affair with Ricardo, and though still not married, had a second daughter with him, Maria, in 1937. But Romilda's moral dilemma was soon overshadowed by the political events sweeping Italy. Fascist dictator Benito Mussolini had taken control of the country, and his alliance with Nazi Germany hurled his country into World War II. When British and American planes began bombing the country, life in the once quiet village of Pozzuoli became hellish and food virtually disappeared. Sophia and her family resorted to extreme measures for survival. And they had to live in the tunnels. It's full of fetid uh, air and rats running around on them and uh, uh, fights and squabbles. And the whole population was down in the tunnels. For nearly five years, Sophia and her family battled sickness and starvation. They lived as refugees in constant danger from air raids and nearby fighting. I think her mother was trying desperately to protect the children. There was no protector in the family, which would have been the father's role had he been there. In 1944, a war-weary Italy gratefully welcomed the liberating armies and their much-needed shipments of food. But in Pozzuoli, although life was gradually returning to normal, memories of the war would linger for some time. Now, 11 years old, Sophia found escape in the town's new movie theater. For entire days, she would sit in the darkness and watch the flood of American films that made their way to Italy. Her favorites were the romances, often starring Cary Grant and Tyrone Power. She boasted of having seen Blood and Sand 12 times. But this shy, awkward girl was about to change almost overnight. And her whole body bloomed, and she grew uh, four or five inches, and this ugly, rejected toothpick uh, suddenly became a full-course meal at a very fancy restaurant. For the first time as she walked down the street, she heard boys whistle at her. Although Sophia's mother had never lost her own dreams of stardom, she realized that Sophia's striking beauty might provide the means of escaping the family's poverty. 
She entered the self-conscious teenager in a beauty contest in nearby Naples, an effort that required the support of the whole family. And they were told that they had to wear an evening dress. There was no evening dress. So her grandmother took down the drapes off the window and made an evening dress for her. That night, Sophia won $35, three rolls of wallpaper, and most importantly, a ticket to Rome. By 1950, Rome was the capital of the bustling Italian film market, and American movie studios were using Italy as a backdrop for their new widescreen spectacles. Hearing that MGM was casting for extras in their epic version of Quo Vadis, Romilda pulled 15-year-old Sofia out of school and made certain that they were among the cast of thousands. After nearly a year of extra work, Sofia was cast as a model for a series of melodramatic photo comic strips called Fumetti. Her striking features and smoldering gaze made her an instant favorite. The magazine's creators even changed her last name to Lazzaro, claiming that her awesome beauty could raise the dead like Lazarus. But it was a chance meeting with film producer Carlo Ponti that would change Sofia's career and her personal life forever. Struck by her unusual beauty, the powerful filmmaker ordered a screen test. But Sofia's tests revealed the aspiring actress to have a somewhat unconventional screen presence. Cameramen complained of her prominent nose, her ungainly size, and graceless movements. They thought Sofia would never, never succeed because she was so tall. Everything was in excess in her. They thought that she was very good looking, but impossible. They told her, you know, take a cigarette, walk under the lamppost and look seductive. So Sophia wasn't able to do that. Sophia's seductiveness was a natural one. She didn't come off well on the screen at all. But Ponty was convinced he had found something special. He continued making tests and began introducing Sophia to important people in the film industry. Within two years, the two began having a passionate affair. Unfortunately, the 40-year-old Carlo was married and Italian law and Roman Catholicism forbade a divorce. She smarted under the black cloud of having repeated what her mother did, and that is involvement, she didn't have a child, but involvement with a man who wasn't marrying her, and in her case, a married man. Now 18 and calling herself Sophia Loren, she survived on small roles in minor films, and made just enough to afford a cramped one-room apartment with Romilda and her sister Maria. It was her turn to play mama, in a way, and to look after her and her sister. And she did so with tremendous uh, generosity. But Sophia's loyalty and hard work was finally paying off. Over the next two years, she earned leading roles in more than a dozen films, including Africa Under the Seas, Aida, and Attila the Hun, co-starring Anthony Quinn. I came to you expecting to find only a conqueror. Yet I discovered a man who has conquered me. In came this girl. Tall, wonderful looking, very striking, and controlling. But I was terribly taken with her, and I was amazed by her presence. But it was in Vittorio De Sica's comic anthology, The Gold of Naples, that Sophia Loren would become a star. <laughs> Produced by Carlo Ponti and longtime partner Dino De Laurentiis, the film called for an actress to play a hot headed and sexy Neapolitan pizza girl. <laughs> <laughs> Neapolitan people are a little different from the rest of Italy because the Neapolitan people are full of personality and full of passion. De Sica and she had some kind of a mysterious bond between them. It was almost intuitive as to what he wanted or what he exuded and she picked up on. So De Sica began to infuse her with a realization of who she was in front of the camera. And that was the beginning of the great run of Sophia Loren films. Critics hailed her confident comedic performance, and with the film's release, Sophia Loren 
became a household name throughout Italy. What is her walking down that street, swinging, full of life, her blouse half unbuttoned, her hips swinging along, and those of us in the theater sat there and watched her go by us and said, there is a new and exciting member of that make-believe world that we, we want to adopt, and we did. We embraced her. The Italian press dubbed 1955 as the year of Sofia. And with 36 films to her credit, the 21-year-old actress soon overtook Gina Lollobrigida as Italy's reigning box office princess. But Sofia's triumph in Italy was only the first step in her campaign for stardom. She and Carlo are out to conquer the world. And to win, they would next have to take on Hollywood. In 1957, while Sofia studied English with a private tutor, Carlo Ponti tried to arrange for meetings with American directors. One of them was Stanley Kramer, who was preparing his upcoming Spanish epic, The Pride and the Passion. Carlo was prepared to meet with Kramer and offer her at some kind of a salary that would make her acceptable to him and to talk about the fact that she was taking English and trying to get her into this movie. But Kramer had seen Sophia's sultry performance in the recently released Woman of the River and already thought the Neapolitan beauty was perfect for the lead. Stanley Kramer showed up and said he would like to hire Sophia Loren and offer $200,000, which of course, Ponte hesitated for about 20 seconds and accepted. But though the English dialogue was difficult for Loren to master, co-star Cary Grant offered some private coaching. I'm staying with him. You mean you're living with him and you don't love him. That's the part of you that's cheap. Soon, the debonair screen idol found himself falling head over heels in love with his exotic leading lady. If you're a little a toothpick from Pozzuoli, and your leading man is Cary Grant, that's got something to do with a fairy tale. And so you're gonna fall in love with Prince Charming, quite obviously. When Grant proposed marriage, Lorenz's loyalty to Carlo Ponti was tested as never before. She loved Carlo deeply, but she was frustrated by his legal inability to marry her. Confused and uncertain, she jumped at the chance to travel to Greece there to star opposite Alan Ladd in 20th Century Fox's Boy on a Dolphin. I'll show you something. I know you. You found something. Mm. A great treasure. Yeah. Thousands of years old. How did you know? Every year, shepherds, fishermen come to Athens with stories about statues and, uh, well, but just stories. So, you don't want to listen. All right. Weren't you comfortable? Didn't they take good care of you? Oh, too much care. They kept me here. No more questions, huh? Good. Now, my question is, mm -hmm. if I bring a crew and diving equipment to Idra, can you locate that exact spot again? Cool. The film was only a moderate success, but the image of Loren rising out of the Aegean, wearing little more than a wet shirt, became a sensation across America. As post-war audiences enjoyed greater prosperity, the sexual taboos that had permeated American culture were breaking down. So too was the strict production code that had kept sex off movie screens. Grittier, more realistic European films introduced the public to exciting new personalities like Brigitte Bardot and Anita Ekberg. And here came Sophia Loren, who was playing young, sexy, beautiful, articulate parts, and I think that that vision of the Italian woman captured some fancy in the Americans. Recognizing that Sophia could be another Bardot, Paramount Pictures signed Ponti and his 23-year-old protege to a four-film contract. Now residing in America, Sophia and Carlo could live openly as a couple in their Beverly Hills home. But Sophia was having a difficult time adjusting to the pressures of her new life. She started to appear stiff and uncomfortable on camera. On her first visit, which was traumatic, it was a, a culture shock for her. It took her some time to overcome it. She just felt like the Italian fish in American waters. This is my farm. This is my home. Inside is my kitchen. 
I put out these blankets and I sleep on them by myself in the night. And upstairs is my bedroom. Sophia's American film debut in Desire Under the Elms was a critical and a financial disappointment. But Houseboat, directed by Melville Shabelson, reunited Lorraine with Cary Grant, and the sparks between them helped light up the screen. It was obvious to me that she had all of this natural energy, vibrance, and everything else, and that the more of the reality I could let her project, the better off she would be. Tom! Carolyn just told us some good news. Congratulations. Congratulations. How much do you want for the houseboat? Don't be silly. They'll want to live on it after they're married. Marriott? That was what I was about to tell you. Please, would you do me the honor to go straight to hell? Didn't you? If I do not say it right, I don't care. Fearful that Sophia's flirtation with Grant would signal the end of their personal and professional partnership, Carlo Ponti took aggressive steps to end his loveless marriage. Finding a loophole in Mexican law, Carlo hired lawyers to arrange his divorce and marriage to Sophia on September 17, 1957. Though it was hardly the wedding Sophia had dreamed of, it was legal. After seven long years, the two could finally embrace each other as husband and wife. But the Ponti's wedded bliss would be short-lived. When Italy got word of the marriage, it caused the biggest eruption there since Vesuvius. The Vatican condemned Sophia and Carlo as flagrant sinners, and the couple was charged with bigamy. In page after page, Italian newspapers ran sharply worded letters criticizing the couple. Well, this brought down the fury of the world because certainly in a Catholic country, this was thought to be some kind of a blasphemy in the whole sense that marriage was being turned into some sort of a game and it, it was trivialized. Faced with a choice between husband and country, Sophia chose to remain with Carlo in the United States. And with the rest of her Paramount contract to fulfill, she sought refuge in her work. You know what he said? You remind him of Black Orchid. Rose, come over, be there when he comes. Stop making romance. Tell him to go find somebody who ain't got a murdered husband in the grave and a son in a work farm. Tell him to go find somebody who's still got a piece of heart left, huh? Her next American film, Martin Ritt's poignant romance, The Black Orchid, reteamed her with Anthony Quinn. In it, she played a repressed, middle-aged Italian widow and showed a side of herself audiences had never seen before. She was wonderful in Black Orchid. She digs down into her psyche. That's the part that she plays best. I remember we danced together. There was a lovely feeling about the It was very Italian. The way a woman holds you when you dance, the way a woman holds your body and the way she moves with you in rhythm. It's different than uh, this far apart dancing of the Americans. In her next film, Sidney Lumet's That Kind of Woman, Sophia exhibited a mature, frank sexuality as a rich man's mistress who falls for a poor GI, played by Tab Hunter. He doesn't look old enough to drink. I'm old enough to do anything. At that time, we were doing a lot of films that were very light and frothy, like, you know, a big milkshake. And I think the American audiences and certainly the American filmmakers were becoming more and more aware that people wanted real people in real situations. And uh, Sophia certainly filled that. She was a woman of the earth. In 1959, the Venice Film Festival surprised Sophia with a nomination as the year's best actress for her performance in The Black Orchid. In light of her recent treatment in the Italian press, she refused to attend the ceremony. But when Carlo insisted and assured her he would hire police protection, she reluctantly agreed. And at Ponti's urging, she did return, but expected the worst in terms of being assailed by the Italians in general because the press had been so bad. When the nervous 25-year-old finally arrived in Venice, throngs of fans turned out to shower her with affection. The outrage expressed by a very vocal minority less than two years before had been replaced by an adoring majority. Sophia won the festival's Best Actress Award. 
She had achieved everything Carlo and her mother had dreamed for her. But Sophia's own dreams of marriage and family were still denied her. For the sake of Italian law, the Ponti's Mexican marriage was annulled, and the couple was forced to live in separate homes upon returning to Rome. To anyone else, it would represent a debilitating setback. To anyone, that is, except Sophia Loren. In 1960, filmmaker Vittorio De Sica announced plans to cast Sophia as the daughter of an Italian peasant woman struggling to survive the hell of World War II. But when Italian screen legend Anna Magnani balked at playing Sophia's mother in the film, the director found himself with a problem. Anna didn't want Sophia to play the daughter. I think that's because she felt that Sophia would overshadow her. De Sica surprised everyone, and he offered Lorraine the pivotal role of the mother, despite the 26-year-old actress's fears that she might not yet possess the maturity and the depth required for the role. But De Sica knew that Sophia's childhood had given her the greatest training possible. She was 26 years of age when she played that. And to give it the scope of worldliness, of being able to portray with such, such finesse the tragedy of war, it must have come from someplace. She didn't read it in books. De Sica had the key to Sophia. He knew how to get what she had to give. He would just whisper something to her or just make her a sign. And I said to her, I said, Sophia, you were so young to play the part of the mother. And she said, I played my mother. I cried for my mother. Two women became an astounding international success, and Sophia Loren was lauded as Anna Magnani's successor. For any young, sexy girl like Sophia, it was not easy to be the mother of the child in so dramatic part. It was perfect the combination between the Siga and Sophia. And they did the sensational movie. Sophia's performance earned her both the British Academy Award and the Cannes Film Festival Prize. But her biggest thrill of all came when she received an Oscar nomination as the year's best actress. Convinced that she had no chance of winning, Sophia skipped the ceremony and stayed in Italy. But at 6.45 a.m. on April 10, 1962, she was awakened by a phone call from her old friend Cary Grant. She had won, becoming the first actress ever to win an Oscar for a foreign language film. There's joy in Italy as the star whose performance in Two Women was a winner. And with director De Sica shares her triumph with mother and husband. She said, Mamma mia, Mamma mia, I can't not. <laughs> she, I won. I, she couldn't believe it. It was beyond her wildest dreams. With each successive role, Sophia Loren was proving herself an actress of surprising depth and sophistication. She also proved she had more than an act for playing the love interest in a growing list of big-budget historical dramas. Produced by Samuel Bronston and directed by Anthony Mann, El Cid was one of the decade's most impressive films. Would you take me with you? No, I have nowhere to take you. I love you, Rodrigo. She has a with kind of uh, almost uh, legendary, mythic, medieval beauty, which perfectly fit the role of Chimane, the Cid's wife. And this served the film very well. You bought your honor with my sorrow. There was no other way for me. The man you chose to love could do only what I did. Why did you come, Rodrigo? 
Did you think the woman you chose to love could do less than you? But my love won't die. Kill it. You kill it! But shooting in the Spanish countryside was not easy for the Neapolitan actress. It was a very tough shoot. All of her part was done in the winter. And there was a scene where we were supposed to have been spending the night in a shepherd's hut. And Sophia was wearing only a woolen dress, no cloak. And I said to Tony Mann, I said, I'm freezing. And I was raised in Michigan. I said, Sophia was raised in Naples. This, this won't do. She never complained. El Cid went on to become a critical and the box office success. And soon after, Sophia reteamed with Anthony Mann for the equally epic, The Fall of the Roman Empire. But it was obvious to her fans that Sophia's English language performances paled in comparison to her work in Italian films. I'm not as strong as I thought I was. I've not learned to live without you. Sophia's real talent is in portraying these women of Italy who she identified with. And there was a spontaneity that never happened in American films. Sophia was able to express that Neapolitan, delightful, honest portrayal of people that, even though you're sitting in the theater and you've never been to Italy, you felt you were there with her. Hoping to duplicate the magic of their past collaborations, Sofia, Carlo, and Vittorio De Sica began to plan a series of new projects. In 1963, Sofia was paired with fellow Neapolitan Marcello Mastroianni in Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, a three-episode romantic comedy which utilized Sofia's versatility and her playful sexuality more than ever. Although Sofia and Mastroianni had worked together before, it was this film that established them as a romantic screen duo unlike anything seen before. She was very Napolitana, very full of life, happiness. And Marcello was very lazy, it was a nice couple together. I mean, that great moment when Marcello's in bed and she's stripping for him, I don't think that there's an ounce of inhibition uh, between them. During shooting, the 29-year-old Sophia was surprised and elated to learn that she was pregnant. But after three and a half difficult months, the terrified star was rushed to the hospital and lost the baby in a painful miscarriage. Once again, Sophia found solace in hard work. Reteaming with De Sica and Mastroianni in marriage Italian style, she earned a second Oscar nomination. This is Sophia Loren at her finest. Vibrant, earthy, irrepressible, irresistible, unpredictable. Sophia was now the world's favorite actress, and she was in demand by major studios for dozens of prestige projects, including Arabesque with Gregory Peck, and A Countess from Hong Kong, written and directed by none other than Charlie Chaplin. Universal Pictures proudly announced the most exciting film of the decade, A Countess from Hong Kong. Take them off. It's silly. We'll see how silly. <laughs> Co-starring Marlon Brando and Tippi Hedren, Sophia found Chaplin's directing as delightful and as entertaining as De Sica's. Charlie acted out each character. He became Sophia Loren. He became the Marlon Brando character. And it was so stunning to watch the, the changes of personality and um, uh, acting capabilities of this man. Sophia had a lovely relationship with him. But despite its all-star cast and legendary director, The Countess from Hong Kong was a critical and a commercial flop. But Sophia's disappointment was alleviated by a welcome change in her marital status. Still pursuing a way around Italy's strict divorce laws, Carlo, his wife Giuliana, and Sophia had now become French citizens. Carlo. Do you have any idea when you will be getting married, Miss Warren? Uh, I hope very soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Soon afterward, Carlo and Juliana divorced, and in a small civil ceremony outside Paris, on April 9, 1966, 31 year old Sophia Loren became Mrs. Carlo Ponti for the second time. But this time, the marriage would be recognized in Italy, and never again would Sophia be haunted by the specter of illegitimacy. After a five year reign as the world's most beloved actress, she was free to live with the man she loved, and she prayed to start a family of her own. In 1967, Sophia suffered a second, more painful miscarriage, driving the normally resilient actress into a deep depression. I think that was the closest she came to losing the pole magnet of her compass. She was really at sea. She was lost. She so desperately wanted to have a child. Doctors warned her that she might not survive another failed pregnancy, and her loving husband was not eager to take any chances. But when Sophia heard of a Swiss doctor who had worked miracles with similar cases, she bravely became pregnant once again. She called Carlo, who was on the set, and Carlo nearly fainted. He said, oh my God, I can't go through that again. Please, I, tell me it's not true. Professor Hubert de Watteville performed extensive tests and after discovering a hormone deficiency, gave Sophia daily injections. He also ordered her to stay in bed for the entire nine months. Fans around the world followed her ordeal and they cheered when on December 29th, 1968, Sophia finally gave birth to Carlo Hubert Leone Ponti. A record 450 reporters gathered from around the world to see the child. In order to care for her son, Sophia limited herself to no more than one or two projects a year. But while filming the epic musical Man of La Mancha with Peter O'Toole in 1972, Lorraine discovered she again was pregnant. Placing herself under de Watville's care once more, the 38-year-old actress gave birth to a second son, Eduardo, on January 6th, 1973. For Sophia to have those babies was miraculous and wonderful. And I mean, she lives and breathes children. She doesn't have that conceit about, it's all about her. It's not all about her. It's about the children, it's about the house. It's about, you know, cooking. In 1975, Sophia reteamed with Marcello Mastriani for a special day a film about a lonely housewife and a closeted homosexual. It was another acclaimed international success. If Two Women was the film of her youth, A Special Day was the film of her adulthood. Embracing her new maturity and content to act in films only occasionally, Sophia now joined President Jimmy Carter in his campaign to prevent child abuse. In 1979, she wrote a best-selling autobiography, Living and Loving and even acted in a multi-million dollar television movie of her life story. She did the only thing that she could possibly do in that movie, and that is she played her mother, which worked. It was, it was quite well done. She was uh, effective as her mother in that movie. But production on the TV movie caused a rift between Sophia and her mother. Romilda returned to Italy in anger, vowing never again to speak to her daughter. To make matters worse, the Italian government was accusing Sofia and Carlo of illegally transferring millions of dollars out of the country. 
To return to Italy and reconcile with her mother meant possible imprisonment for Sofia, but it was a chance she felt she would have to take. She was arrested and found guilty of tax evasion, and the government sentenced Sofia to one month in prison. After serving only 17 days, Sofia was released. Ponti was acquitted of all charges, and Romilda and Sofia made up. If you have to pay such a price to see your family and to see your niece and to see your, um, uh, your own country and to have your smile back in your face, I think, uh, I think you, can, you can do it, even though you suffer very much. It was a dramatic climax to one of the greatest fairy tales of all time. Throughout the 1980s, Sophia Loren became a new kind of sex symbol. She proved that a mature, beautiful woman could gracefully make her way into middle age and beyond. I think that uh, uh, by getting older, there's nothing to do with a sex symbol. I think a sex symbol, you are born a sex symbol or you are not. There's nothing to do with your age. In 1991, Hollywood paid Sophia's career the ultimate compliment. She received a special Academy Award, this time honoring her lifetime of achievement in film. It was a glorious tribute to a still active career. Getting a second Oscar for your career and all that goes through in your mind, why did you get it, why did they give it to you? the ambition and the dedication and the sacrifices. I think it has been the most wonderful moment of my life. I will never forget it. Never, never, never. But when her mother, Romilda, died later that same year, the loss to Sophia was devastating. She was able to hold her in her arms when her mother died. And this was of the utmost importance. She was totally broken by this death. She was uh, torn apart. The mother had been both parents, and, and she lost both parents the day the mother died. Her mother was the single strongest influence in her life. She admired her so, she loved her so, she lived for her so. I think her greatest battles have been to be true to her mother, her mother's dream. In 1992, Sophia received an appointment as a United Nations Goodwill Ambassador. The young girl who played caretaker to her family during the aftermath of World War II was now focusing her attention on the crises in Somalia and Kenya. But Sophia was still not ready to relinquish her crown as one of the world's most beautiful and acclaimed actresses. In 1994, she appeared with her beloved Marcello Mastroianni in Robert Altman's offbeat comedy, Ready to Wear, and the famous duo stole the show from an all-star cast. One year later, she sizzled as Walter Matthau's unlikely love interest in the hit comedy, Grumpier Old Men. Sophia chooses, she decides. It's really interesting, the things that she's been offered, and she doesn't have that desperation. She loved the part in Grumpy Old Man. Matched her sense of humor. I know Malthow told me, he said, can you imagine that? <laughs> They're paying me all this money to make love to Sophia Loren at my age? Because she still is the sex symbol. And whatever she has inside her, that is not going to age. I think she's a woman for all times. She embodies womanhood. She's woman, she's mother, she's wife, she's love. She's everything. She's everything that we want to be. In an era when nothing seems to last, Sophia Loren stands as a beacon of reassurance. Her successful marriage, her enduring career, and her ageless beauty suggest that it is possible to have it all. And the story of her struggle from the depths of poverty to the heights of international celebrity continues to inspire. Isn't it glorious what can come of somebody who really had nothing and what happened to this beautiful girl? I think she's a great role model. She is a survivor, and she's a beautiful human being. She's phenomenal. When she acts, she is breathless. She is really breathless. She is glorious, magnificent. 
I have an idea there must be a portrait of her up in her attic that is aging every year while she remains the same. She is one of the most remarkable actresses I've ever worked with and quite an extraordinary woman. In 2004, Sophia Loren won a Grammy Award in the Best Spoken Word Album for Children category for her work in the recording of Peter and the Wolf. One of the most recognizable women in the world, in 2006 she was one of eight women chosen to carry the Olympic flag during the opening ceremony of the Winter Games held in Italy. The screen siren proved that beauty is indeed ageless when she struck a sultry pose at age 71 for the 2007 edition of the famous Pirelli calendar. With more than 100 films to her credit, Sophia Loren is one of the most beloved international movie stars to ever grace the silver screen.